Uh, today we're heading into or well, having our last message for, for James, and we're going to leave James behind. Um, and uh, we're talking about the, the, um, the prayer of faith, which is the last chapter. Uh, next week we're going to be heading into uh, Joshua chapter 7 and I can sin, so I encourage you to read that. It's a good bit of scripture. It's a great narrative. And it's, uh, Achan is a great example of what you shouldn't do. And uh, he's uh, good for us in that. And then we're going to have a couple with uh, Jonah. Um, and then I think uh, Louis will be with us. A few more single messages. Then we're going to get into Mark. So if you want to start reading Mark in advance, we'll be looking at travelling through Mark. And then the plan, Lord willing, we'll look at um, Acts a little bit later, just to sort of take us into the year. But just before we uh, get into the message, I'm going to ask Betty to come up and read uh, chapter 5 for us of James. Thank you, Betty. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the labourers who move, mowed your fields, which you kept back from fraud, by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your, heart, your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets, who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your sins, trespasses to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Thank you, Betty. Um, 
James is pretty strong with his words, isn't he? He doesn't mix them. He's a pretty intense fella. And so it's great. Let's uh, next slide, thanks. So this one is really much, uh, as you would expect, I suppose you could say a summary chapter. Um, he's warning once again the rich oppressors. It's obviously a concern for James because he picks it up in the first chapter and somewhere else as well from memory. He talks about patience and suffering, again we remember from chapter 1. Uh, the prayer of faith, which is what we're talking about today, which is pretty much central to what he's on about today. And he touched on other subjects like judgment. You know, he, he's very concerned about judging others and treating others accord, accordingly as not as we should do. And the use of words, although he's not talking about the tongue. He says, look, he's saying, let's yes be yes, you know, be oh, don't get oaths. In other words, think about what you're going to say. Don't say too much to us or when you have to. Um, so he's focusing a bit on that as well. Thanks. But this is the message for today, the prayer of faith. And James reminds us, and this is really the context for us today, James reminds us of the prayer offered in faith by God's children. That's what he means by a righteous person, we'll talk about that later, is powerful and effective. And there's three things we're going to say from James, the implication from the text from James. First of all, prayer should be the first thing we do. James implies that. Um, don't underestimate the power of prayer. Again, James reminds us of that. And you know what? It's a key action. It's a key thing that you can do for each other, for others. You know, James talks about faith and actions. One of those key actions is praying for one another and praying in the situation. And he talks about prayer both in the individual context but it's in the corporate as well. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for, uh, for the book of James. And as we head through the last chapter, we thank you for the blessing um, that this book is and the, the, the letter that was written to the church so long ago that is so relevant and important for us today. And we thank you that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. And when we're talking today, first of all, um, prayer should be the first thing we do. James is implied, it's implied by James. Is anyone among you in trouble? So um, we heard suffering. The word, the Greek, uh, from the text earlier, the, the Greek word there means trouble generally, but also means suffering. So some of the translations have picked different versions up. But trouble means or any trouble, whatever's going on in your life. If things aren't going well, whatever, whether it's unwell or if you're in trouble, what should you do? Pray. Is anyone happy? Praise. We'll talk about it in a little while. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church and pray over them and anoint them with the oil and the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the person well, a sick person well. Um, the Lord will raise them up. If you just looked at those verses and read them in cursory, you wouldn't really think about the emphasis James is putting on prayer. But for James, it is fundamental. The implication there is, whatever is going on, what should you be doing? Praying. It's the first thing you should do. And remember, he's speaking to Christians. So he's just as he was back to the, the diaspora, the, the dispersed um, um, uh, Jewish church, he's also speaking to us down the generations. Thanks. And go to the Lord as a first action, no matter what the concern. David gives us some insight here. Um, there's two things I've picked up on. They're worth reading. They're great narratives. The first one is uh, 1 Samuel 23. Uh, he was, Saul was still chasing him. And he was going around doing his usual raiding the Philistines and doing the stuff that David was doing and gathering his horses in some way and getting stuff together. And there was a little town or a little place called Keilah. And the Philistines are about to attack it. And he says to the Lord, and this is what I like, rather than rushing out to do the thing that David's good at, because he was a very good soldier and a great commander, instead of rushing out to do what he was good at, the first thing he did is he inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack um, these Philistines? And the Lord answered, go attack the Philistines and save Kelo. Now the Israelites, the people around him, were very worried about the Philistines. And they weren't so sure. So David goes back to the Lord again and asks the same thing. And the Lord says, yes, do it. So what I'm saying is David went to the Lord first. He inquired of the Lord first. Even though he had the ability and the skill set and certainly the power to do it, he still went to the Lord first. The second one is 1 Samuel 30. And I love the sense of irony here. Here he is out attacking all the Philistines and, and raiding and doing stuff. And then someone had the audacity to do that to him in Ziklag. And he gets back and finds that his wives and all his men's wives and all the stuff's gone. 
And of course, they're about, as I said, the Bible says they're about to stone him. Now, I don't know if they actually got to literally stone him, but that, when they say that, that's the, the, the way that the, they're expressing their increased grief and unhappiness. What does David do? The first thing he does, he finds his strength in the Lord. Before he does anything else, he goes to God. But then he says, And David acquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue the raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, the Lord said. He answered, You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. He got everything back. Absolutely everything. Not one thing was missing. Now, once again, David could have rushed off, but he went to the Lord first. So David's in, he's inquiring is a good example for us. It should be the first thing we do, no matter the concern, small or big. Thanks. Um, and we'll coming back to James. If you're in trouble, if there's anything, suffering, difficulties, whatever the case may be, is anyone in trouble? Let them pray. Unsure. You need some discernment. We see other places. Draw on the wisdom of God. Pray. Is anyone among you sick? We've had that the last few weeks, haven't we? We all had lots of spot and colds and that time of year. Anyone among you sick? It's wonderful to see the um, the prayer app that uh, WhatsApp that Sophia and uh, Steve have put up. It's great, isn't it? That's like the old prayer chain. Remember that in the old days when you'd ring up and you'd ring the next person and the next person would ring. We got that. It's wonderful to see that and the stuff that comes up. Um, uh, you know, sickness and issues that worry us and things like that. Anyone among you sick? Pray about it. Thanks. Anyone caught up in sin? Um, and this is an important thing that so he's speaking to the church. I'm not going to try and interpret um, this one here too much because you can spend ages on this. You know, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray. I mean, that has its own message in, its, in itself. For each other so that you may be healed. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. Sin always affects the church. And we'll talk about this next week with Achan's sin. Corporate and individual sin always affects the church. Make no mistake about that. And so he's saying, if anyone's caught up in sin, then pray about it. Be open about your sins. Be open about your shortcomings. Be open about that and pray about it. And if you're concerned about others. Don Miller, the guy I mentioned to you, the guy who was so focused on... Um, and it's a shame you can't get his DVDs these days, I'm sure, because it's probably long gone. Such inspirational teaching. But he tells, tells us a story about when he was a pastor of a man he was visiting who had alcohol problems. And he would keep visiting, and the guy would say, oh, I don't want to talk to you, Pastor, thanks anyway. So he'd keep going, coming. And anyway, across the road from him was a little old lady who was determined this was not going to go on. So she said, Lord, I'm going to go and lock myself in my bathroom, and I'm going to pray until you save my brother across the road. These are Don Miller's words. Anyway, she must have got the sense that he's, the Lord heard it because she came out of the bathroom at some stage. But anyway, the point being was Don gets this call from this guy. And he says, um, Pastor, I'm ready to see you now. So he goes around there, talks to the guy, leads him to the Lord. And of course, Don, being a pastor like all of us, thinks, oh, my ministry's had impact, my prayer, meeting him was worthwhile. Until he finds out from, a, from the neighbour that the little old lady across the row had prayed him out of the situation. And Don was saying, if there's something concerned, and the, the two points he makes about this, which is important. First of all, never underestimate the power of your prayer. And that's, of course, what we'll talk about in a moment. Secondly, she prayed in faith. She did exactly the thing that James said. The prayer in faith will work effectively. And so if we're concerned about others and it's the implication of the church, do something about it, pray about it. Thanks. You see, the human inclination, the, the, uh, it should be the first thing we do, because the human inclination is sometimes the prayer can be the last resort or not at all. I encourage you to read... Joshua chapter 9, and we maybe later on we might travel through Joshua, it's a great book. Um, it's about uh, the Gibeon deceit, it's called. Now, uh, as we'll see next week, chapter 9 is in the middle of those chapters where uh, Israel is marching through Canaan, effectively, and destroying all the opposition on the way through. Is God's bringing his plan into place through Joshua. Anyway, Gibeon was uh, like, a, it's like a farmer's property, it was like the property next door. And they, they were at sort of um, position not far from where the Israelites were. And they were very, very concerned because there's no way Israel would ha let them be free. They, would, they were concerned that they would be wiped out. Um, so they decide to develop a little ruse. 
Now remember, Joshua was a strong man of God. He led spiritually and led well. Um, and so these um, guys, they, they got the, the donkeys. It's a great story. They put dust all over them, heads and dust, and they get some old mouldy old bits of bread or whatever it was. And they go next door effectively to the Israelites. And they say, we've travelled on a great journey. And what happened? The Israelites sampled the provisions, but what didn't they do? Inquire of the Lord. Now this is Joshua. I mean, he's a man of God. The other people were really on fire. They were moving through under God's strength. And they didn't do a simple thing like that. Now in the end, you know, Gibeon comes under them as, as servants or whatever. And the point being is there is plenty of cases where, and this is one example, where, where they should have inquired and found out because we can be deceived if we don't. It's not always the first thing we're indicated to do. Hence why James is saying, guys, if you're in trouble, pray about it. That's what he's saying. That's just the implication of it. And of course, praise. We forget that praise is very much part of prayer. James says, if you're happy, give thanks. Praise God. That's part of prayer. Um, how often do we give thanks when things are going well? Well, sometimes, it's, I know myself, we, we pray about the things that are important around us. We often forget to give thanks. And you can see James's words there. Thanks. So the first thing is, from James' perspective, which he's teaching us, and both from Hybels and certainly from Don Miller, the some two greats in prayer, and I'm sure you've read your own books and lots of people around prayer, prayer um, is the first thing you should do, and it's fundamental. Secondly, don't underestimate the power of prayer. That's what James tells us. Don't underestimate the power of it. Sometimes as Christians we can forget. The power of a righteous person is powerful and effective, according to James. Um, in other words, a righteous person's prayer, I'm not sure my grammar is so good there, affects results. In other words, not just the elders or the special people, everyone who exhibits the attributes of a disciple. Now we've travelled through James. For James, there are two things that are important. You have the faith in the living God and you have the actions effective of the disciple to follow it up. For James, that is what he means by the righteous person. That's what he means by that person who's got a right relationship with God and is living the way God wants, to the best of our abilities. I mean, we all sure fall short. In that case, the prayers are powerful and effective. Men may spurn our appeals, reject our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? Thanks. Next one. Um, Mary the Queen in Scotland had this to say, I fear John Knox's prayers more than an army of 10,000 men. I think it's a great statement, that. Um, the power of prayer. The second thing I'd say about this is that we can all, never understate the power of prayer because it's powerful and effective, but we can all call upon effectiveness of prayers. In other words, every one of, what I'm saying here, every one of us can think back about times when we have prayed and things have happened. Sometimes miraculous, haven't they? James does exactly the same thing with Elijah. It's very clever. He draws on something of Israel's history. The Israelites would know exactly what he's talking about. Elijah did have his issues, make no mistake, but he was a powerful man of God. But he's not calling on him because he's some special kind of prayer. What does he say? Elijah was a human being, just like us. Now he's talking to the whole church. He's talking to everybody who communicates with all the believers. And he's saying, Elijah, a human being, like you and I, prayed. And God acted. So he's using that example. And he's using that as an example, drawing on the history. We can all draw on our history if we forget about the power and practice of prayer. And we can see that there, thanks. And always in faith. Again, Don Miller told us about that story, and I just love the story. This dear little lady, in faith, knew that God would answer her prayer, and she went and did that. Um, the prayer often in faith will make the sick person well, the Lord will raise them up. And what we implied there really is, we believe God will respond. Do we believe that? If we pray, do we believe God will respond? That's what James is talking about, a prayer of faith. Believe it. it. comes from our belief that prayer changes things. Do we believe ch prayer changes things? Then why don't we do it? There's really the implication from James. 
not be double-minded. Oh, I don't know. I'll offer a prayer up. I'm not sure how it'll go. James says, stay away from all that. That's not right. It's always offered in faith. Thanks. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. The person that, this, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. There you go, James, letting you know that one. Pretty strong, isn't it? He's not mucking around. Tell us what you really think, James. I mean, he's really quite strong in that sense. He says, believe it in faith. I told you a story about Elijah. Elijah had his issues, make no mistake, but he was human. David, and let's just think about David, he inquired of the Lord, his, his Lord, as we said, he's a great example to us, but he was also a very flawed human being. Look what he did with Bathsheba in that. I mean, he used his power and authority not only to take another man's wife and, and get her pregnant, he also made sure that the husband was killed. That's a pretty big use of power, isn't it? But he still inquired of the Lord. And if we get caught up in sin, then pray about it. But believe it, no matter the situation you're in. Thanks. And the third aspect, the second aspect is um, never underestimate the power of prayer. And first, of course, is prayer should be the first thing we do. And for James, it's one of the key actions we do as a disciple, one of the things that we do that prove that we not only love the Lord Jesus Christ, but we love those around us. And it's broken up really in this way. You can see that particular text we're talking about. There's the individual prayer. And there's the elders at prayer, and of course that was very significant in the Jewish church context, um, and the prayer, friends of prayer, and the prayer of the prophets who prayed. In other words, what James is saying, there is a range of situations, both individual and corporate, that we pray. The entire pas passage effectively there is, this is not words, it's someone else's words, is dedicated to issues of pastoral community prayer. It could be titled, Pray for One Another, that particular passage. In other words, we all have a responsibility to pray for others. The implication is we should engage people in prayer. There is nothing that makes a man, a love us a man as much as a prayer for him. Now, I don't know if you ever noticed, if you have difficulty with a person at work, or we have a difficulty with a, with a relative, or you have a difficulty with a situation, you start praying for them, a lot of the times you start to think differently about them. You notice that? It actually changes the way you think. You might still have problems with them, but you start to think differently about them. And you start to take a different perspective. That's really what he's saying there, in that sense. It makes a big difference. We should engage in prayer. Thanks. And Jesus himself models this for us, doesn't he? But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. This is the Lord Jesus who has connection directly with the Father. And he prays for Simon. This one here of um, Samuel, I, I just love it. As we have heard before, and I've mentioned Samuel, he was probably one of these most significant non-king leaders uh, Israel's ever had. He was a powerful man of God, a very godly man. He had a wonderful mother, we know Hannah, who probably raised him uh, in many ways. Uh, and so he was a significant leader. He, he, was, he anointed two kings. He was significantly involved in the history of, um, of, of um, Israel. He says this, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you, and I will teach you the way that is good and right. This is the great man Samuel, the man who leads Israel, who has a direct connection with God, and his concern is to pray for others. It's an incredible, in, uh, incredible influ uh, I mean, example to us. Both in Jesus and Samuel, they pray as an example. We do it for others. See, there's nothing more important, loving and profound, than to pray for others. That's really what James is saying. Pray for one another, he says. It should be the first thing you do. Do not underestimate the effectiveness of your prayers, even if you're having a bad week. Even if you feel that you're a long way from God. In fact, the more we feel, feel our sinfulness, the closer we are to God. Just look at um, Peter 5 for that example. Oh, sorry. Luke chapter 5 for that. We often think that if we've had a bad week, we're, we're a long way from God, we're aware of our sinfulness. One of the greatest gifts God can give us is an awareness of our sinfulness because it makes us more dependent and focused on him. And we all fall short. Every single person here, every single person that James was talking to falls short. That's why he's reminding us the importance of prayer. 
But there's nothing more important, no matter where you feel you are in the course of your life, to pray for others and to pray for your own situation too. Next, thanks. Next week, Achan's sin. It's a historical re- event, but it's relevant for today. Some great stuff in that. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for the, uh, I guess, the quick run over a very important chapter in James, the importance of prayer. I want to thank you for those prayer warriors that have gone before us, those quite wonderful teachers, um, and I think particularly of, of Don Miller, he's such a man who blessed so many in the course of his life, and particularly through his prayer ministry and his teaching on prayer. Each and every one of us will know people around us that have taught us and, and teach in prayer and we've read books. We thank you for their ministries as well. We are reminded, Lord, of, of James and the emphasis he puts on prayer. And, Lord, it's something, the first thing we should do. But, Lord, also, let us always remember that our prayers are powerful and effective. For those that are journeying with you, even if we're having our high, bad days, they are powerful and effective. And, Lord, there's no greater grief, gift, no greater thing that we can do for one another than to pray, to bring them before the throne of glory. So we commend the rest of the service to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.